Okay. All right. Um, let's start. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our TIES webinar. This is the second TIES webinar of our Spring 2024 edition. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. David Rolnick. He is an assistant professor and Canada CI FAR AI chair in the School of Computer Science at McGill University and at Mila Quebec AI Institute, where his work focuses on applications of machine learning to help address climate change. He is a co-founder and chair of Climate Change AI and scientific co-director of sustainability in the digital age. Dr. Rolnick received his PhD in applied mathematics from MIT. He is a former NSF mathematical sciences postdoctoral research fellow, NSF graduate, graduate research fellow, and Fulbright scholar, and was named to the MIT Technology Reviews 2021 list of 35 innovators under 35. Welcome, Dr. Rolnick. Uh, I would just like to say that the talk will be for approximately 45 to 50 minutes, and I would request everyone to mute themselves for the duration of the talk and ask your question towards the end. And with that, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am very excited to, to be chatting with all of you in this, this um, fantastic audience um, that really brings together some of the communities that most need to be talking together um, if we're going to have an impact on the problems that we are facing as a society. Um, so I am, uh, I work on machine learning uh, intersected with climate action. And before I get into the different facets of that, I'd like to start out by, I realize people are coming from different, different backgrounds. And perhaps it is useful to talk through really what machine learning is, because there are a lot of buzzwords floating around and it can be useful to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So what is machine learning or what are the various different keywords which people hear associated with machine learning? I'm just going to get my headset on so I make sure that everybody can hear me. Okay. Um, and can you hear me okay? Uh, um, yes, we hear you. You, you can hear me uh, there. Yeah, okay. We hear you. Great. So um, the definition of, of uh, AI overall is extremely broad. Um, AI, according to the OECD's AI principles, means really any computer algorithm that makes predictions, recommendations, or decisions on the basis of a defined set of objectives. That could refer to anything from linear regression to uh, transformer architectures for deep learning. Um, and within that, machine learning is a set of AI algorithms that infer patterns from data. Um, for example, uh, something that would not be machine learning would be a computer algorithm for solving chess, for playing chess very well, that goes through all possibilities and uh, mm -hmm. selects moves that would be particularly good based upon what plays out for, in very promising ways. However, uh, a machine learning based approach for the same problem, playing chess, would be to look at, look at the uh, patterns on a board and on the basis of past patterns, infer what would be a good position to be in. Uh, so machine learning is not rule-based, typically, um, and it, it has become particularly popular recently uh, and more effective thanks to the advent of deep learning, which is also called neural networks. Uh, neural networks and deep learning are not quite the same thing, but they're very close to the same. Now, when people say AI now, they generally mean machine learning. Um, that is not always true. Um, and when people say machine learning, they sometimes mean deep learning, but that is definitely not always true. There are a lot of other kinds of machine learning that are uh, very effective and also very widely used. Uh, everything from Bayesian methods to random forests. Now, some example areas that you may have encountered within machine learning or heard referred to I include computer vision, which has to do with processing images, optimization, which is what it sounds like. There are many kinds of optimization that aren't machine learning based, but uh, some are. Uh, natural language processing, which uh, it has to do with processing text and has become very uh, widely uh, visible lately, thanks to large language models like ChatGPT. But um, GPT is only one of, and other large language models are really just one part of natural language processing. There are a lot of methods that don't involve large language models at all um, that are arguably still more widely used and perhaps more effective in many applications. 
Reinforcement learning and control um, are other areas of machine learning that are relevant, often in control of physical embodied systems like robots um, and other kinds, uh, robots, uh, factories, uh, um, autonomous vehicles, for example. Um, now, uh, some buzzwords that you may have heard as well, uh, foundation models, general purpose AI, generative models, uh, these all mean different things. Uh, foundation models and general purpose AI are more similar. They refer to uh, algorithms that can be used to uh, address a variety of different challenges, generally because they've just seen a massive amount of data. Um, and so they're not specialized for any one particular uh, purpose, so they can only work within a, a very specified set of circumstances regardless. They don't do everything, they do several things. That is something that is worth uh, noting. They don't do everything, they do several things. Uh, generative models is a term that is uh, used to refer to kinds of AI algorithms that generate generally images or text or videos. Um, and those kinds of algorithms are, uh, again, very visible lately, but they actually represent very much the minority of AI algorithms. So generative AI is just one relatively small subset of AI. Um, same thing with foundation models. Um, those are the, the minority, though increasingly, increasingly popular. Um, okay, so with those definitions in mind, um, we can talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of machine learning uh, within within this this context. Um, so some of the strengths: uh, performing straightforward tasks quickly and automatically. Uh, machine learning is generally very good at automating some things that humans might do very easily, but would be very time consuming to scale up labeling images in certain ways, for example. Finding subtle patterns in large data sets. Since machine learning is about inferring patterns from data, generally the learning part of machine learning is looking at a lot of data, finding patterns that are useful for solving a problem that is posed to the algorithm, and then uh, generalizing those patterns to new, uh, to, to new settings. Um, but the... Um, the key thing here is that it is about finding patterns in large data sets. And so machine learning's strength and its weakness is that it needs those large data sets. It's able to find very subtle patterns, but it does require a lot of data. Um, optimizing complicated systems can also be very useful. So if you have a complex system with many knobs that can be turned to change the properties of the system, that can be a really good setting for machine learning to um, uh, explore various different settings and uh, um, learn to optimize in, a, in a, an effective way. Weaknesses. Um, as I noted, data is the strength and the weakness of machine learning. Um, your algorithm is going to be at most as good as the data that you give it. So if the data is incorrect, which it often is, um, or if it's biased, whether uh, in, um, in any kind of way. Um, so for example, geographic biases, language biases, uh, biases about uh, who is annotating the data, those kinds of things get perpetuated or uh, worse within the algorithms. Um, and uh, furthermore, the algorithms generally cannot think outside the box. So one doesn't, one talks about generalization in, in machine learning, but really there is very little ability to extrapolate beyond the training data. Uh, generally it's possible to interpolate. So if you see data here, data here, you can interpolate between them a bit, but really going out there is very difficult. As an example, if you train uh, reinforcement learning algorithms to uh, play certain video games and you change the background color on the video game, it actually makes it impossible for the algorithm to perform well. That's changing the background color, something that a human would just ignore um, because these algorithms are not really able to think outside the box and they're not, they don't have a world model. They don't have an ability to think critically about things. Uh, they don't have the ability to think at all. They are pattern finders, essentially. Um, and one other part of that is that they generally can't explain reasoning. It, these are generally black box approaches, which uh, take in a problem and give out an answer, but don't necessarily say how they came to that. There are interpretable machine learning approaches, which people are working on, and I know that is a focus of this group, um, That, but um, it is a focus area because it's something that is hard and it's something that isn't all, uh, it isn't always possible. Okay, so here, hopefully everybody's uh, more on the same page with respect to what machine learning, AI, different things, uh, different words associated with those terms are. Um, now, why is machine learning connected to climate change? Uh, there are a lot of different ways that machine learning can be useful in helping tackle uh, climate change, the problems that are involved in climate action, climate change mitigation, adaptation, climate science, as well as uh, other areas of, of um, 
sustainability and environmental goals. Uh, here I'm going to be talking about a lot of different areas of climate action, from electricity systems to agriculture, forestry, and other land use, to heavy industry, to climate modeling. Um, and there are more specific applications than I can cover, of course, if you're interested in diving into all of these. These are figures from a big compendium paper that we wrote, trying to detail lots of areas of opportunity and areas where machine learning is already being used in fighting climate change. So you can see that paper here if you're interested in diving into more detail. But I'd like to first talk about some of the overarching themes that we see for how machine learning can be relevant in climate action. The first theme is in improving operational efficiency, so taking some complex automated system and helping it run using often lower energy, um, uh, also potentially lower cost, but lower energy is often the most aligned with climate action, though not always. Um, for example, optimizing the heating and cooling systems of buildings, HVAC systems. Here you can see a small uh, thermostat being used in a personal house, but this is also going on uh, with smart thermostats and smart heating systems in industrial and commercial buildings increasingly. Steel and cement manufacture, also a major source of greenhouse gas emissions globally, uh, representing about uh, 10 to 15 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions together. Um, and even slight improvements in the efficiency of those kinds of industrial processes can have a huge impact. Uh, so we're increasingly seeing machine learning be used in those kinds of industrial contexts. Gathering information taking large unstructured data sets and turning it into useful information to help guide policies or other kinds of decision making. For example, taking a look at a satellite image like this and estimating the deforestation in that image, or perhaps this is an agricultural area, so estimating crop types um, and uh, gathering information about how land is being used to help inform climate relevant land use decisions and policy making. Or flood risk and taking a, a more adaptation oriented uh, task. Um, the UN, for example, is using uh, AI algorithms to uh, localize the uh, target areas for interventions when flooding has occurred around uh, particularly the Indian Ocean monsoon. Um, I should mention all of these areas that I'm talking about on this slide. AI and machine learning are already being deployed. These are not futuristic applications. These are things that are already in production, already being used in the private sector, often quite extensively. Um, the uh, next theme, um, after distilling information information into into useful um, into useful insights, is gather is 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 forecasting, uh, predicting what's going to happen next on the basis of often time series data. So here there are many uh, applications in um, managing electrical grids. So in order to manage the electrical grid, you need to know how much supply there is of electricity at any given moment, which depends on if you have solar and wind, how much the sun is shining or how much the wind is blowing. So that varies from moment to moment. You need to predict it. And then predicting demand as well to ensure that the, there's enough supply to meet demand. You don't want to waste electricity by having too much. And you also don't want to turn on your fossil fuel generators uh, when you don't need to. You want to ideally have a system that is around equilibrium there. Um, and predicting supply and demand are both great tasks for machine learning. Uh, the UK's national grid is a world leader in this respect, uh, employing algorithms for both now casting, so forecasting electrical electricity supply down to the minute, and predicting demand as well. Often this was done manually before, but recently, for example, a new uh, machine learning based algorithm by the UK's national grid reduced the error in demand uh, prediction by about 40%. So there's a lot of room for uh, helping these systems to, to run better. Speeding up simulations. I'm often asked, can AI just approximate the entire world's climate? Possibly, but we have a really good physics-based understanding of the, of the world's climate. There is no particular reason to just replace it all by AI. That would be uh, missing the point. The physics is really good, but sometimes the physical simulations take a very, very long time to run. Um, running climate models can sometimes take months, even on supercomputing infrastructure. And so it's really uh, important to think about how to speed up these approaches. Oftentimes there are already heuristics which are being used and machine learning can be part of those heuristics. For example, approximating particularly time intensive pieces of climate models or increasing the resolution of the output. So you go from a low res output to a high res output, it's called downscaling. This can also be relevant in other physics based or engineering based simulations like in grid planning. And the final theme I want to touch on is scientific discovery. Uh, there are many kinds of innovation which are necessary in uh, climate tech, in 
uh, fighting the climate crisis. And machine learning can be really useful in helping reduce the amount of time needed for innovation in contexts like materials discovery and design, where we need to iterate over a lot of possible materials for use in, for example, batteries, uh, perovskites used in solar cells, and many other kinds of materials. And trying them all just is a really takes a really long time. Um, machine learning can help decrease the time to uh, production by suggesting good experiments to try, not replacing experiments, but suggesting useful new experiments to try based upon how past experiments have run. Um, so these are at a really high level, a lot of considerations for the kinds of ways in which machine learning can be relevant in climate action. It is worth remembering, however, that machine learning and AI are not a silver bullet. They're not magically going to solve climate change. I don't think I need to say that to this audience. Uh, I do sometimes have to remind you know, journalists. Um, it's important to remember also, impactful applications may not be flashy. Oftentimes, there are particular applications of AI and machine learning that get a lot of public recognition, but that is not because those are, those are the most impactful for climate change or for society, generally speaking. Um, for example, uh, self-driving cars get a lot of press. Um, they are probably going to make climate change worse, as we will explore later in this talk. Um, but in the transportation sector, there are lots of other applications of machine learning that are really impactful. Like, for example, predictive maintenance. Deutsche Bahn, the German railway operator, is using machine learning extensively, both to optimize train timetables and for predictive maintenance to work out where railways are in need of repair um, and where failures might occur. This is really important, but it's not flashy. It doesn't necessarily get the same kind of press coverage of self-driving cars. But from a, uh, a climate impact standpoint, it's much, much more impactful. Um, and as a side note here, you'll notice that none of the applications I talked about here actually use large language models, which are probably the most popular, uh, uh, most visible kind of AI right now. Um, that is because large language models generally aren't applicable in these kinds of contexts. Sure, there are ways that you can use LLMs uh, like GPT to solve some particular problems. You can add a chatbot to anything, but A, it's unreliable. B, the problems that are being solved are generally not particularly necessary. They're not really bottlenecking action. Happy to talk more about that. But generally speaking, large language models just don't figure in because there are a lot of other kinds of machine learning that are more impactful. And then finally, interdisciplinary partnership is essential. Once again, something I don't have to tell this audience. Um, it is really important for every one of these applications that machine learning be used together with existing techniques and be really thought of as a tool to help alleviate existing bottlenecks rather than something that's going to come in and just magically save the day because it never will. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about paradigms for machine learning innovation before going on into some of my own lab's research in innovations in machine learning driven by problems in climate action. Um, so there's the typical paradigm for innovation in machine learning, what you might think of as a methods driven paradigm. And that paradigm is to um, create algorithms based upon certain stereotyped benchmark data sets. If you've ever worked in machine learning or work with machine learning people, you've probably seen a lot of these data sets, things like ImageNet, uh, MS Coco, MNIST, CIFAR-10, et cetera. These kinds of data sets are used to compare different models. They're also used to pre-train different models. And really, there are a few key data sets, depending upon your area, that everybody uses. You typically measure success based upon certain stereotyped metrics like classification accuracy, test loss, et cetera. Uh, there might be like RMSE as a kind of as a kind of loss. There might be various kinds of things, F1 score, blah, 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 blah. Uh, problem agnostic techniques. The goal typically in methods-driven innovation in machine learning, the typical paradigm, is to come up with a method that is as general as possible. That's so you don't have to think about the details of the method and also so that it's supposedly most impactful. You can apply it here and here and here and here. As we'll see, oftentimes by being problem agnostic, you end up being uh, useless in all of those problems, but um, that is at least the goal. Um, and generally using large amounts of training or fine tuning data, sometimes across lots of different problem regimes to try to be as general as possible. And bigger models are generally better, partly because you're using lots of data. So you really, in order to accommodate all of that data, you need bigger models, but generally also because bigger models are seen to perform better. More parameters, bigger size, bigger capacity, you can do more, right? So that's the, that's the paradigm of innovation in machine learning. And that has been really productive. It has given rise to some useful algorithms where useful is everything from 
very popular to actually being used in a range of applications. I'm not here to say that the typical paradigm shouldn't be used ever. However, generally speaking, machine learning neglects a complementary paradigm that should be considered just as much, which is impact guided or application driven innovation. And so in impact or application driven innovation, the goal is to use data from real problems rather than to use these stereotyped benchmark data sets. Think about what real problems you are actually looking to solve and work with the people who understand and own those problems. To measure success, not based upon these standardized metrics alone, but think about how the algorithm is going to be used in practice. There are going to be different kinds of uh, constraints that you will need to satisfy or different kinds of objective functions that you will need to optimize for based upon how it's going to be used in practice. In some contexts, that might be speed. Maybe the, the use case that you're working with is going to really rely upon your algorithm being fast and scalable. Maybe it needs to be robust in various different kinds of ways. Um, maybe it needs to be interpretable. These kinds of, of metrics and very specific metrics, because interpretability doesn't mean just one thing, can be optimized for depending upon the application machine. And the next thing is to leverage additional information where possible. By thinking about the specific nature of the problem, you can sometimes build in more information than would be incorporated, generally speaking, in this kind of problem. Because the exact problem that you're working with has this additional information. Incorporate constraints as well. Think about whether there are tight constraints that need to be satisfied in order to make the problem work. Um, not just things that you're optimizing for, things that have to be true all the time. And then making algorithmic tools accessible. This is maybe a tech transfer part of the picture, but really not stopping at the algorithms and thinking about how you can work towards something that is actually making a difference, making impact more than just, more than just innovation. So that innovation is a way to the impact. And what we find uh, is that when one's doing this, one often ends up building sometimes bigger algorithms, but most of all, smarter algorithms. Think about building smarter, not just bigger. Think about smaller data, smaller algorithms, sometimes being more useful in practice. And we can zoom out a bit here and look at the, some, of the, some of the reasons why I might be considering this impact-guided innovation pipeline, because frankly, the typical paradigm often doesn't work. People are very surprised sometimes to find that if you're trying to perform well with satellite imagery, remote sensing algorithms, you can end up using these fanciest new computer vision methods and having them fail. Transformers, vision transformers, often perform worse than random forests in real world tasks on remote sensing data. And the reason is that vision transformers were not designed for remote sensing data. And the typical uh, uh, algorithms that you're using for one of, the, one of these tasks are not designed for that task. They are designed for some abstraction of the task, which isn't necessarily dealing with the constraints or the nature of the problem and data that you're working with in practice. And so impact-guided innovation is a way that you could think about the actual kind of innovation that you need, which typically blends with the methods-driven approach. So you can adapt the transformer uh, approach to a particular application domain or a particular kind of problem within that application domain, and you can innovate based upon the specific constraints that you see there. And so this is what I'm gonna be talking about in the rest of this talk, thinking about how to innovate in machine learning with a view to the impact and the particular applications that you're working with. And then as I noted before, collaboration with domain experts is key at every stage from framing the problems to designing the algorithms and also preparing a pathway to deployment. So let's look at each component in this, um, in this list. First of all, using data from real problems. Let's look at what not to do, first of all. I talked about ImageNet. ImageNet is a very popular data set for machine learning, uh, in particular for computer vision. Um, computer vision relies very heavily on a few key data sets. ImageNet 1K, which is the, the, the smaller version of ImageNet, is a very popular one. It's used to evaluate models and to pre-train for applied settings. So pre-training, like where you use the data from ImageNet to develop your model, and then you add a little bit of fine-tuning data later on. Now, ImageNet was, like many other benchmark data sets, derived from internet data, and it was chosen and labeled without relevant experts in the room. It was done, it was the, the, the data was chosen uh, 
by the whole approach was designed by computer scientists using WordNet, which was designed by, I guess, linguists. But it, it was really wasn't designed based upon experts in the in the domains relevant to those images. And in particular, 27% of ImageNet 1K is actually wild animals. Um, there's also a hefty amount of dogs and cats, so domesticated animals, but we're working just with the wild animals and we'll think about those. And we worked with ecologists, experts in these wild animals, experts in the specific kinds of animals there, to analyze this part of the data set. So we found that in ImageNet 1K, 12.3 of the images are just wrong. They are mislabeled. They are the wrong thing. And 11.9% of the categories are wrong in that they overlap with each other. Um, for example, um, meerkat and mongoose are two categories. And meerkats are a kind of mongoose. And most of the pictures uh, in both of these categories are meerkats. So basically, you have two categories where any image could be classified in one or the other. This is kind of shocking, given that people compete for a 1% increase in performance on ImageNet. And here we have massive percentages of the images just being wrong. Um, there is also heavy bias. Uh, we, there are, we analyze many different kinds of bias, but including geographic bias. Uh, here we see that the species are heavily biased towards the United States, not just in what classes are chosen, but also within a class. So for example, here is the class J, which is a, a variety of bird. More specifically, there are 49 species of Js around the world. And these are some of them. This is the blue J. Uh, this is the green jay, the Eurasian jay, and the Sichuan jay. They're all found in different areas. Sichuan jay is found in Sichuan province. Eurasian jay is found in Eurasia, Europe, and Asia. And the green jay is found in Mexico. Can you guess which of these four jays is the one that is most present in the data set? Well, two thirds of the images are actually of this first one, which is the blue jay. The blue jay is found only in Canada and the US. And when you have two thirds of the data coming from one species out of 49, that definitely does skew how the algorithm is going to perform. Now, there are many algorithms that are trained using ImageNet, and those are the, exactly the same kinds of algorithms that are being used, for example, to classify images on the internet, to classify your photos, and so on. And I've even talked to people who've used ImageNet designed algorithms in order to classify wildlife specifically. So when you have that, you are testing on mostly North American data, and you are also going to perform best on North American data. So you are perpetuating these same kinds of biases. The internet starts out more driven, more uh, populated by US data, then it continues to resurface US data, if that's what the algorithms are, are trained to, to predict. And so it's this really vicious cycle. Um, so really, we should be thinking about how we're designing these benchmark data sets, or even whether we should have benchmark data sets as consolidated at all, um, because what is being used is really both wrong and significantly misleading and guiding us towards regimes of bias and inaccuracy that we don't want to be. Now, impact-guided data set design can look very different. Here are two data sets that we recently released. One is called Climate Set. This is about CMIP6 data, uh, Climate Model into Comparison Project, which is climate model data from lots of different climate models that's used by, for example, the IPCC, um, and making this available for machine learning-based climate model emulation. Um, here, we've taken data from across CMIP6, all these different archives, and bringing them together in order for machine learning practitioners to be able to work with this data and setting it up uh, as a benchmark goal for machine learning algorithms. There are lots of different approaches that you can use here. And we evaluate those. And we actually find that because you're looking at data holistically, you get very different results. You find certain algorithms perform better on one data set, certain algorithms perform better on another data set. By looking at this big, big combination data set, you actually get different results. So it's really important that we think in terms of grounding the kinds of insights that we get algorithmically in what people are using and needing in practice. And then the next data set I want to highlight here um, is called SatBird. Here we're trying to predict bird occurrence patterns, what's called encounter rates from satellite imagery. We're taking an image like this and we're trying to say, oh, what are the frequencies of birds that you're going to find there? So I guess here is a red-winged blackbird, which is found in marshes. So presumably the algorithm thought that there's a marsh in the middle here. Uh, and this is predicting data from citizen science observations, um, notably from eBird. And what we can do here is we can show that machine learning algorithms can actually predict the uh, observations of species on the ground roughly, the, the rough probabilities of some species on the ground with geographic long information and satellite imagery. And setting this up as a benchmark data set really uh, encourages the, the machine learning community to attack this problem, which is of great relevance to those working with species distribution models in ecology. Okay, so let's take a look at the second uh, point here. 
measuring success based upon how an algorithm is going to be used in practice. Mm. There is an area that's very promising in um, machine learning for materials design, um, where the goal is to uh, try to effectively decarbonize our economy. And currently, fossil fuels are required in many settings in heavy industry and transportation. In these difficult to decarbonize sectors, oftentimes there is a need for electrocatalysts, which can be used to convert low carbon electricity to uh, electrofuels um, or to store the electricity. Now, elect electrocatalysts can be um, designed very uh, in a very time-intensive way for particular applications using density functional theory simulations, these quantum chemistry uh, formulae and uh, software systems. But these are very computationally expensive. So machine learning is increasingly being used, especially it's called graph neural networks, which can work with uh, graph structured data that looks something like this, where you have an adsorbate being adsorbed onto a catalyst and they're, they're reacting in some way. And you'd like to understand the chemical properties of this so you can determine whether the catalyst is very good. So, um, we introduced an approach called FeyNet here, and um, stands for Frame Averaging Equivariant Neural Network. And the um, the challenge that we're trying to approach here is that in graph neural networks for materials modeling, the same configuration may occur with rotation or translation, um, and we want the model to be able to ignore this. So, for example, here you have oops, sorry, you have two configurations of the same uh, molecule, which here is ammonia, and you are uh, you want the same rules of physics to apply to, regardless of how the ammonia is oriented, right? So uh, invariance means the output is preserved under transformation. Um, for example, the energy of the system should stay the same. Equivariance means that the, when the input is transformed, the output is transformed too. So for example, forces are a vector quantity. So if you rotate the input, the output should rotate as well if it's a force. Now, sometimes you want invariance, sometimes you want equivariance, but these are challenges that are common across materials property prediction. Now, a common solution here is to transform the input so they don't depend on the spatial configuration. For example, you can use radial or Bessel basis functions or the Kleps Gordon tensor product. Um, if you're wondering what these refer to, they are complex mathematical objects um, which can be used to ensure that invariance or equivariance are satisfied. And these can be very powerful, but they're also very complicated, complicated to understand, complicated to implement, and sometimes they make your model significantly more time intensive to run, uh, as well as to understand. And that partly defeats the purpose of the machine learning, since heavy architectures were sort of running counter to the goal of making this be speeding up the computation. And so instead, we outsource equivariance to the data, and we use a, an approach called frame averaging, uh, I'm going to go over the details a little bit quickly here, but the, the, the basic idea is leveraging technically some ideas from representation theory, where you can always make a function equivariant by symmetrizing it under the different ways that you can transform it, just averaging over all the possible transformations. And frame averaging is a way to do this more cheaply when the group of transformations is infinite. So if you could rotate by any, any infinite number of different uh, amounts, for example. Instead, you can symmetrize by using specific frames to represent the group and just averaging over those. And so we introduce a frame averaging based neural network architecture that provably retains invariance or equivariance while making it possible um, to, well, to do, well, 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 being sufficiently computationally lightweight that you can actually do useful things with it. And importantly, uh, this allows us to um, pass useful directional information between input atoms. So you've got this invariance property, you can still pass the geometrical information. Happy to talk about more, uh, more about the details later if you're interested. But the takeaway overall is that by thinking about what is needed here, which is being equivariant and invariant, but also really lightweight, you can actually have a much better output with respect to the metrics that people really think about. So that is both the accuracy or the loss in this case, um, the, the mean average error of the, the property prediction. Um, which is, I think, the, the relaxed energy when you're relaxing the adsorbate onto the onto the, the catalyst. And um, also with respect to speed. So here you can see that our approach called FeyNet is basically the fastest approach, almost as fast as the fastest approach, and it is the most accurate. So it's it's really best by compare on these two different axes. It's better than the, the 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 it's it's better than these other approaches while being significantly faster than them. And on this other data set, our approach is um, as accurate as the as the the best approaches, while being as fast as the fastest approach. 
Okay, so uh, let's go into the, the next bullet point here, leveraging additional information where possible. So here we're going to be talking about remote sensing for agriculture. Mapping crops and forecasting crop yield are really essential as climate change threatens agriculture systems around the world and leads to food insecurity for many regions. Machine learning tools are increasingly being used to process remote sensing data and um, process it at scales that would not be possible otherwise. Governments are turning to machine learning to say, oh, where are people planting this kind of crop and how is that crop doing? However, agricultural data are very sparse and imbalanced across crops and locations. What that means is you really can't reliably find labeled data. Unlabeled data is easy often from satellites, but labeled data requires on the ground annotations. And this is very imbalanced across different crops and across different locations. So this is, for example, data from our partners at NASA Harvest. It's called the Crop Harvest data set, where the orange data points are the points that really have meaningful information about what kind of crop is there. The blue points are just, is there a crop there or is there not? Orange points are what kind of crop is there? And you can see that's really, really sparse and imbalanced across the world. And we'd like to really quickly adapt to a new location and crop with minimal additional data. We'd like to be able to do that fast so that we don't need very much more labeled data on the ground, maybe no labeled data on the ground. And we're gonna use an approach called meta-learning. Background on meta-learning, um, Meta learning refers to learning in such a way that the model can quickly adapt to a new task with new data. A very popular framework here is called model agnostic meta learning or MAML. And here it's a deep learning based approach where a neural network is trained specifically to maximize the effectiveness of gradient updates on new tasks. This is a little diagram from the original paper by Chelsea Finn and others. Um, and the uh, approach works, this is in parameter space, so you're moving the parameters of your neural network, and you're normally moving the parameters of your neural network in such a way that you're decreasing the loss in, for example, the loss with respect to task one or task two or task three. But in MAML, instead, you move to a place in the parameter landscape where you can quickly adapt to any one of several tasks. You could adapt to task one over here, you could adapt to task two over here or task three over here. And your goal is to be in a place where you can quickly adapt with very minimal new data to whatever new task you're seeing. This is a training paradigm that can run across different neural network architectures and different tasks. It's very widely used in meta learning. So we build on top of MAML and introduce the task-informed meta learning paradigm. So here, task-informed meta learning can be added to a meta learning framework like MAML, and there are two components to it. First is that we are trying to incorporate as much information about the task as possible. Remember, the goal is to adapt to new locations and new crop types. So we build in that information. We say, okay, algorithm, you're gonna encode the information on the lat long of a given data point and on the crop type. And that will make it possible when you see a new lat long or a new crop type to really be able to generalize as well as possible. Suppose you've seen coffee in Kenya and maize in Brazil. You wanna see maize in Kenya or coffee in Brazil. Well, you have the semantic ability to generalize there because you know what coffee is and you know what maize is. You know what Brazil is and you know what Kenya is. So the auxiliary network is able to take this metadata from the task, which previously was just thrown out or incorporated in very naive ways, like along with the input. And it incorporates, encodes that in such a way that it can modulate the hidden representations of the meta learner. Um, and this enables the meta learner as it is learning a task to incorporate that kind of metadata in a meaningful way. The second component, which I won't go into in as much detail, is forgetfulness. This is to prevent the model from overfitting to some particular task. When a task is memorized, so it's performed almost perfectly on, that gets dropped dynamically from training so that you ge can generalize to other regimes as well. That deals with data imbalance across different tasks. So we can see here that our performance on crop harvest, which is that data set that I showed before, is really, really much better than the, the, the prior approaches. We compared with very fancy approaches to MAML2, which I haven't shown here. It also outperforms those approaches. Um, so incorporating this information is really, really valuable. And in particular, you can see on something like this Brazil task, um, it really blows all the other algorithms out of the water. And the reason for that in the case of Brazil is actually because Brazil has even less data for fine tuning the algorithm on. You can see this in this these plots where over here on in the Togo plot, you can see as the amount of data that you are seeing decreases for your new task, most algorithms stop performing very well, but our task-informed meta-learning approach 
Timmel is able to generalize really effectively, even when it's seeing no new data. So if it's never seen an image of coffee in Kenya, it can generalize from maize in Kenya and coffee in Brazil to that new regime, just because it's incorporating the metadata in a meaningful way. So by really understanding the nature of the problem, we can incorporate that into a new algorithm that leverages that for improved impact. Um, we also seen that this approach, task-informed meta learning, is useful across different circumstances. It's useful in regression problems, like in crop yield prediction. It's also been useful in um, heating and cooling systems, in buildings, and in carbon flux estimation in uh, sensor systems. So um, the next project that I want to talk about is incorporating constraints. So here, I want to talk about grid optimization. Now, the electrical grid is a complicated engineered system. And balancing it, so ensuring there's enough power for everybody, requires solving a non-convex optimization problem, which looks like this, and is called AC optimal power flow. For those with some optimization background, you know that a non-convex optimization problem means that it's hard. That's basically just what it's saying. It's, it's, it's a hard problem to solve using traditional algorithms. Um, this is a quadratic problem, but it's still non-convex, and so there isn't a good, a good uh, approach for solving it. And so in practice, what people do grid operators who are trying to work out how much power to produce in order to meet demand, they need to solve this problem, but solving it exactly takes too long. So they typically linearize the problem. They simplify it greatly by linearizing this quadratic, quadratic problem. And in the process, they waste large amounts of power, uh, especially in the case of solar and wind power. Now, typical deep learning would take a look at this problem and say, OK, well, you're trying to minimize this objective function subject to these constraints. I'm going to use a loss function that combines the objective function, which I'm trying to minimize, with violation of the constraints and say, OK, well, I'm, I need to minimize this. And I need to also minimize violation of these constraints. That's what's called a soft penalty. It says, don't go too far away from the constraints. And what happens is you don't go too far away from the constraints. You almost satisfy the constraints. and in this case, that is not good enough. Even slight violation of the constraints means that this solution is useless. This can lead to a blackout because violation of the constraints means that electrical power flow doesn't work. And so the grid breaks and people actually die. So nobody would ever want to use an algorithm like these typical naive deep learning approaches that would potentially lead to a grid failure. And so you don't use these algorithms. That's why grid operators don't use deep learning in this kind of context, at least. So we design a deep learning approach that can approximately solve non-convex optimization problems and importantly satisfies hard constraints. It's always ensuring feasibility. Now I'm going to quickly go through this. Uh, it will be a very fast explanation for rather technical algorithms. So bear with me here. Um, um, and I'm happy to answer questions on it afterwards. The for problem formally that we're working with is an approximate mapping from X to Y, where X is a set of parameters parameterizing your space of optimization problems. Um, and you're going to output Y, which is the optimum for a particular optimization problem of this form. Okay, you have an objective function, you have inequality constraints, and you have equality constraints. And these are all parameterized by X, and you're trying to find the optimum Y for any such problem. Now, the approach is going to be multi-part. You're going to have a neural network involved, but you're also going to have some other different steps. Let's go each through each of these steps. First of all, your neural network is not going to output all of your variables. You're not going to output the entire vector y. You're going to output only some of them. And that's because you have these equality constraints here. And with the equality constraints, you can use some of the variables to predict the others. If you have only uh, if you have five equality constraints, then you can predict five variables using those equality constraints without, without uh, just from the, the other variables. Generally speaking, you have five fewer degrees of freedom. And so we can solve for the remaining variables. Now, this is not necessarily a procedure that you can do in closed form. The procedure might not be um, in closed form, but it is still something that you can use uh, using the implicit function theorem. And so the key here is, in order to train your neural network, you'll want to be able to differentiate through everything. For people who have worked with deep learning, this is like, you need to have these things be differentiable so you can backpropagate through. And how do you differentiate through a, 
an implicit solver. For example, if you're using Newton's method or some other numerical method to get these other values. Well, actually, because you have a constraint, an equality constraint, you can use the implicit function theorem to work out the derivatives of these variables with respect to these variables. So that enables you to do the differentiation, which enables you to train the neural network. Then there's one other component, which is the inequality constraints. You already satisfy the equality constraints by construction. Now we need to satisfy the inequality constraints. And so for, for doing this, what we're going to do is we're going to um, use gradient descent. We're use, going to use gradient descent not on the parameters of the neural network, but on the output of the function. We're going to do gradient steps on these, on these variables until they satisfy the inequality constraints. You can think about it as moving about on this green manifold of satisfying the equality constraints until you get to the blue subset of the green manifold, which also satisfies the inequality constraints. And in practice, after a few such steps of gradient descent, you get inside the blue region. Now, you have to stay on the green manifold, and this is math which just goes through that. Then you train the entire thing end to end using a soft loss function. What I said is not sufficient, but it is useful in helping you do the training where you're penalizing violation of the constraints. That's important to start learning. Make sure you just get into the place where you can actually solve it with these completion and correction procedures. And if you roll all of these things together, you can train the entire neural network end to end, and you end up with something that satisfies the constraints. There is no violation of the constraints and is almost as good as the uh, specific problem specific optimizer. So this is an optimizer that was custom designed for this particular problem and is, use, is used in powerful applications. And we are almost as good in terms of objective value, no constraint violation, and significantly faster. 10 times faster naively, probably more like 100 times faster if you account for GPU parallelization, which we didn't do. Because we're just trying to make it as sort of underselling it as possible. All of these other baseline approaches don't work nearly as well. Um, they generally are very infeasible. They don't satisfy all the constraints. Okay, so the last point that I want to talk about here is making algorithmic tools accessible. And here I want to talk about um, our algorithms quickly for automated monitoring of insects. Insect populations around the world are collapsing, and that is leading to major ecological consequences as well as costs for ecosystem services like pollination and agriculture. But monitoring insects typically requires specialized expertise, so there just isn't enough expertise to do the job. There are a million species of insects known in the world, and probably more like 10 million um, that are undiscovered. So monitoring insects is really challenging, and we don't have the human capacity to do that alone. So we're developing automated sensors that can augment entomologists and help them to gather the data they need to make ecological um, decisions and land use decisions. In collaboration with the various partners from different stakeholder groups uh, in ecology, we are building the software that works with these automated solar powered devices. These devices can attract insects with UV light and photograph them automatically and our algorithms then localize and identify them. This is what these uh, systems look like, uh, the hardware. Um, currently we're focusing on moths, which represent about 10% of all species of anything, including plants and bacteria. So there are a lot of moths out there. And so there's a very, big challenge for computer vision. We have thousands of different species available at any given place. Um, and the data is very long tailed. There are lots of different um, species which have very, very minimal data to say nothing of the fact that there are many new species. We actually recently went down to Panama and ended up finding probably several hundred new species that it's still being finalized that were ne have never been recorded uh, in science before. So we're actually also working on algorithms to address that challenge. Um, the data is then sent to entomologists for interpretation and proofreading. And importantly, we've built these software tools. Uh, we have a website which will shortly be launched for this, where you can actually input your data as an ecologist. You don't need to know anything about algorithms. You can just use our algorithms to process your data and get out images that look like this, where you have uh, also very nicely parsed stuff that you can download, showing what species are predicted by the algorithms, how long they stayed, how many there were. And you can go through and proofread so that you don't have to rely upon the algorithm. You can correct it and make the algorithm better uh, for the future. Um, I want to close by talking about how machine learning can also negatively impact the climate. It's not just a situation of positive applications for climate change. There are many ways in which machine learning makes climate change worse. And what probably gets most visibility is computation-related impacts. There's energy required to run machine learning algorithms, and in some cases, that's quite big. There's also embodied emissions from hardware. It takes carbon emissions to create servers and also takes water and heavy metals. 
This is low for many algorithms, but it is high for some. Notably, the very public, uh, publicly prominent algorithms uh, in large language models are very computationally intensive. It is worth noting, though, that machine learning is a very broad term. It can refer to the computational equivalent of elephants as well as mice. When you say that something's a mammal, it could be an elephant, it could be a mouse. Most mammals are small, and most AI algorithms are quite small as well. Most of our algorithms that we use in my group can run on a laptop, even if an LLM might require a server farm. So it's worth noting that this can vary a lot. However, there are a lot of other ways in which machine learning is also negatively impacting climate change we don't necessarily get talked about. Um, there are the immediate impacts of applications. A, a machine learning is used to further applications, notably in fossil fuel extraction and exploration, leading to, in some cases, a 5% production boost and estimated to create uh, half a trillion dollars in additional profit for the oil and gas industry just by 2025. So machine learning is a lever and you can use it to do all kinds of things. And some of those things are really bad for the climate. And there are systemic impacts of applications as well. There are AI-enabled advertising systems, which are pretty much all of the advertising that you will encounter on the internet these days. Most of it's using AI, and that is designed specifically to increase consumption, or at least increase purchasing of certain items. And that is having a significant impact, doubtless, on industries like fast fashion, which are extremely unsustainable, and fast fashion in particular is the third biggest contributor to climate change after agriculture and uh, construction. Autonomous vehicles are a great uh, uh, example of how these systemic impacts can actually also be like very indeterminate and can be shaped by how we shape the algorithms. Autonomous vehicles, if you're working on autonomous buses, that can help people use public transportation. But if you're working on autonomous self-driving cars, personal cars, that is anticipated to increase the amount that people drive by lowering the barrier to driving, even if each mile driven becomes a little bit more efficient. Overall, it's expected to make climate change worse. And so I'll leave you with these thoughts. AI for good you, is a term you hear a lot, yeah, but it doesn't mean just adding new good applications of AI and machine learning on top of business as usual. It means shaping all applications of AI to be better for society at large. We should be thinking as technologists of how we work on everything, not just the explicitly climate relevant applications, thinking about the broader impacts of all of these and recognizing that most of what AI is doing is not going to be under the heading of climate action. It's going to be under the heading of just AI for business as usual. And how we steer that is really, really important. I wanna thank my research group at McGill and Mila for working on all these fantastic papers. And I also wanna thank Climate Change AI, which is a nonprofit that I um, co-lead, um, which provides resources for those interested in the intersection of climate change and AI. We have lots of different reports, including that report, Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning, and others aimed at policymakers and practitioners from different areas. We have an event series, upcoming events at AMLD and iClear, notably, and a summer school, which applications will open for very shortly. It's not just aimed at folks in academia. Um, it is academia and lots of different industries, and it brings people together from many different stakeholder groups. We have uh, innovation grants, uh, which the call for will also be opening soon, where we fund research projects at this intersection. And we have various other resources. I particularly would point out the newsletter, where you can get an update every month on work happening in this space, funding and job opportunities, and lots more. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Dr. Rowling. That was a captivating talk. And uh, it's certainly given me, and I'm sure a lot of the people in our community, a lot to think about. And I would request everybody to unmute themselves and give Dr. Rolnick a big round of applause. And with that, I would like to open uh, the floor to the audience to ask questions. Please uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask any questions. And um, I guess I can uh, begin. Um, so Dr. Rolnick, you mentioned um, this uh, typical paradigm versus impact guided paradigm, which is fascinating to think about it that way. But I would like to ask, so isn't there this middle ground where the typical paradigm is enabling the impact guided innovation and impact guided innovation? Oh, you're muted. Ah. Whoops. Yeah, absolutely. These interplay with each other and I didn't really talk about that, but um, there is a, uh... There is a need for for innovations going both ways, right? So sometimes um, the 
impact guided uh, paradigm really draws upon what's being done in other areas uh, and from methods driven innovation. So method driven innovation might have, for example, given rise to MAML, the model agnostic metal learning framework, but just using MAML doesn't help you as, no as much as using an impact guided innovation of task informed metal learning. So that is really a marriage of the two different approaches. It goes the other way too, though, for example. Mm -hmm. So something like UNET was originally published in a medical imaging venue, I believe. And this is now used across lots of different applications, and it's used in many methods-driven uh, approaches as well. So it goes both directions. And sometimes the metrics that you're thinking about or the kinds of data sets that you're thinking about also lead to uh, methods-driven innovation. So it, it goes both ways, yeah. Oh, all right. I think Thank that you. Andrew is next. Yeah. Uh... Andrew, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Rolling. Thanks for the thanks for the talk. I've got quite a technical question on the Fay network. Just sure. Um, so I'm working with Equivariance over at the Uni of Edinburgh. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts on about. So you said that uh, you say outsourcing the Equivariance to data is a uh, more computationally efficient. Do you think? Um, that this approach, rather than embedding equivariance into the neural networks, is kind of like the 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 best or kind of the future way of um, embedding equivariance into into systems, um, specifically for chemical applications as well. If that makes sense. Yeah. So it depends on exactly what your application is. I mean, the goal of this was to design something for particular kinds of applications where you really want it to be very lightweight, um, and that is what we're doing. In some situations, you may have different goals in mind. There may also be a different set of transformations which you want to encode. So there may be other ways to do this. I'm not here to say that, that you should always be using frame averaging. We did, however, use the frame averaging approach on top of some of the existing innovations. We weren't trying to you know, go completely alone uh, and, and uh, ignore what other people have been working on. You know, just like see if we could make these things computationally cheaper. And so I think using having this as one of the tools in your toolkit is really useful, depending on what you're trying to, to optimize for. Great, thank you. Cheers. Uh, Jay, uh, you can now ask your question. Hey, Dr. Rolani, thank you so much for giving this talk. Definitely learned a lot and a lot to think about. Um, I, I just had a question. So uh, my background is professionally within the tech industry, but not necessarily in climate. I'm trying to learn more about machine learning and I'm currently participating in a fellowship program with Climate Base. One of the key mm -hmm. components of that is I get to take on a capstone project. Um, it's funny because my original proposal was basically to do um, create a vision transformer for satellite imagery, and you kind of um, said that that's not a great idea. <laughs> um, and curious, like, mm -hmm. you know, what else? What can I do that would be impactful? I'm you know, full transparency, not super deep into the machine learning space yet, but I'm really excited about the area and, and just yeah. wanted to make that. So, so you can look at approaches that build on transformer architectures for satellite imagery if you're interested. There are approaches. It's just an out-of-the-box vision transformer isn't going to work very well. Gotcha. Um, so we put out a recent paper that's using transformer architectures for satellite imagery, it's actually a pixel-based transformer. It's using it's using pixel time series with multiple different features, and it's using an MAE-based approach, mass auto encoding. Hmm. Um, so you can you look at this approach, which uh, we, we call Presto, um, and this is now being widely used by uh, many different stakeholder communities. Um, for example, the World Serials Project, um, because it's really lightweight. It's, oper it's not actually operating on the images, it's operating on pixel time series, but it is using transformers and it's pre-trained, so it doesn't need very much data down, down, down the road. So you can take a look at the Presto algorithm, but also you know, other approaches in this area are definitely using really like carefully thought out innovations like SAT MAE and scale MAE were some of the, the, the resources that we were thinking about. There, there are many other different approaches that are using these state-of-the-art machine learning approaches, but they're using them in a way that's really specific to the application domain. If you're interested in satellite imagery, there's a great review paper put out recently by Esther Rolf and Hannah Kerner. And if you look at Esther and Hannah's paper, um, you can see some of the challenges and what is needed in innovation within that space. So again, I don't remember what it's called. It's Esther Rolf and Hannah Kerner and Constantine Klemma and Caleb Robinson. Great, thank you so much. This is super helpful. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? 
uh, please feel free to either type it in the chat or ask. Uh, I have another question that I would like to ask on Feynet. Mm -hmm. uh, so have you considered or what your uh, what what would be your um, opinion on considering the topological structure using topological data analysis and general more geometric deep learning approaches? Okay, so topological data analysis and geometric deep learning, I we haven't been looking at uh, we haven't been looking at that. I haven't honestly found that many areas where topological data analysis is being used. In practice, it feels like, you know, I used to be a pure mathematician. There are a lot of areas where I feel like sometimes one works in them because they're really exciting, methodologically speaking, and not always because they are they are the most impactful. And I feel that some applications of topological data analysis, not all, but some look like this. Um, I would be interested in talking with somebody who's an expert in it, though, to see whether this is a, one of those areas where it could actually be most impactful. Like graph neural networks are not necessarily the only thing that you could be using here. One of the reasons is actually that chemical bonds are not really a thing in these kinds of set settings right. since they're reacting. Mm -hmm. First of all, you're, you have an ionic compound in your catalyst. And so there aren't really chemical bonds there. And then also this thing is reacting with the surface. And so there aren't bonds, there are bonds breaking and forming. And so... Yeah. The, the, the graph structure is really an approximation and you use graphs, mm -hmm. you, the edges in your graph are just proximity based. So mm -hmm. it's a really good question. You could definitely be using sort of more geometric or topological approaches. It's just, I'm not aware of people doing that successfully. So um, I think I would feel very free to explore this cautiously. Uh, I, I see. So my advisor is actually an expert in TDS, so, but I think she's fantastic. A, then <laughs> I, 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 I defer, I defer to, to, to you, uh, on, on this, Yulia. Um, well, I think she's probably, okay. She, she can, she can probably speak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I need to say that it's not a certainly, uh, a universal, you know, one size fits all. But in a even topology of the data is really rich. And mm -hmm. for some agricultural data, for example, especially in the situations when you have sparse data. So we, we mm -hmm. look at some of the crop yields. So if the data is sparse and the underlying topology is rich, then mm -hmm. agent persistent homology does help. However, if you have more homogeneous data structure, then Clearly, given all the scalability issues, there is no reason to add any, you know, persistent features. So it, it very much depends on the data. But I was listening uh, for a talk, and especially in situations when you have uh, scarce label data. So uh, adding, so adding uh, contrastive learning with some topological perspectives, maybe it would be uh, help. For example, we looked at, at that for wildfire detection, where you have very few label data and label data are noisy. And it turns out because as wildfires, you can view them as living on the manifold. So adding these high order structures, which are described, for example, either through uh, high order combinatorial operation or for topological structures, that's when you have a benefit. That's okay. really interesting. I'd love to look into your work on this. And more yeah. broadly about extreme events, I think that, that that could be really useful. I know that there's been some some fantastic work on um, anomaly detection uh, right. using this in, in uh, avalanches. And I wonder whether the topological data analysis approach could be useful in such contexts as well, because there again, these are anomalies. So you, you really are looking for some kind of outliers. And I haven't seen a TDA approach to that. I'd love to. I'd love to look into your work more and just be be more aware of these kinds of approaches. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. We haven't looked at avalanches, but we have looked at wildfires, and up to some extent, we looked also at agricultural ones, uh, agricultural yeah. uh, crop yields data. No, this is this is this is really great and eye opening. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Um, I should jump off. I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have another yeah. meeting, I'm afraid. And, uh, and, uh, and thank you so much for doing this again. And um, I will be uploading this to YouTube in like the coming week. And um, I'll fantastic. stay in touch with you. And thank you again. And if uh, would you be open to sharing your slides in case any of our community member? Sure, I can do that. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, thank you very much thank for the you. invitation. And uh, it was a pleasure to, to speak with it, you. No, it was a pleasure to have you. It was my honor. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm.